Good morning. Welcome to Zwingli United Church of Christ. For those of you who don't know me, I am Roxy Colash, and I am honored to help out with the service today. It's great to see all of you on this very fall-like morning, but as I told myself, there are still 17 days of summer, so it's still summer. It's just a cooler summer day. Um, if you entered the church by the east entrance this morning, you notice the flower bed has been cleaned up and replanted with lovely flowers. That is thanks to Tim and Sherry Wixer for their hard work. When you see them, please give them a th big thank you because it is very lovely. Uh, Pastor Lance is on a well-deserved vacation until Wednesday, September 7th. If anyone needs anything, please contact the church office. Um, Helping us with worship today is Reverend Tiff Bates. Most of you know him. Um, he's usually at St. John's in Monroe. So thank you so much for being here today, and we look forward to your message. Um, special music today is from Megan Leitner. Thank you, Megan. We uh, will enjoy her gift of music. I was listening to her um, earlier before anyone came in, and it's lovely, so you will enjoy that today. Um, after worship... You are invited to social hour in the north room. Um, for those of you that are worried about the stairs, please remember that you can go through this door, kind of do just a little maze area, but you can get to the north room, so you won't have to worry about stairs. So we would love to see all of you. It's great to have social hour back again after about a two-year absence due to that COVID thing. So um, we look forward to seeing all of you then. If you ordered cookie dough, from the New Glarus Bakery as part of our fundraiser um, for the parking lot. Come to Fellowship Hall on Sunday, September 11th to pick that up. As you saw earlier scrolling through the announcements, we do have a lot of prayer requests this week. Um, Kathleen Grossen has also asked for prayers for Alton and Ruth Sherman, her parents, as they are going through some medical things this week, and also prayers for um, their children because when you are a parent, as those of you who are parents know, you spend the majority of your life worrying about your children. But then just remember that as parents get older, your children also worry about you. So prayers for um, parents and prayers for the children that love them. We also ask for prayers for Melissa Trumpy's family. Um, it is getting close to a year that she has been gone. We just ask for some news for peace for Gary and Denise, and especially for her children. Um, it can't be easy, and I'm sure it does not get easier with every day. So just continue prayers that she comes home in some way back to her family. Are there any other prayer requests this morning? You're all so quiet. Either you're very intently listening or it's making me a little nervous. You're all quiet. All right. If you would like to support the ministry of Zwingli Church, the contact information is on the screen. And for those of you here today, there are offering plates in the back and in the front here. Please drop them off um, on your way out after the service today. So let us take a few, few moments now to dedicate these gifts. Please join me in the prayer of dedication and thanksgiving. We join with Jesus in giving thanks for the little things we can see, that our eyes may be open to the greater possibilities we had not imagined. May our efforts be multiplied by your grace so there is more than enough to feed the world. Thank you for such rich blessings. Amen. And to quote Pastor Lance in his favorite part of the sermon, and I enjoy it also, the Lord is with you. Thank you. 
invite you all to join me in the call to worship. Be glad in God and rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy, all the upheart, upright of heart. God has called us by name and poured out abundant mercy upon us. God has multiplied our resources and blessed us with food for body and soul. Through faith that we may be rooted and grounded in love. We come seeking a new vision and to hear a new song. May God bless this time of worship that we may grow in faith and in love for one another. Join me in unison for the invocation. O God of deliverance, we lift up our voices as we sing praises to you. Our hands are uplifted to give you honor. Our eyes are open to behold your blessing. You are a caring God who knows all of our needs. We seek your presence in this hour of worship. Open our hearts and minds to see your glory in our midst and sense your presence in our hearts. This is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. For those who are able, please stand and join us in our first hymn. Okay, I think, yeah, there we go, we got it. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, glad to be with you today. Many familiar faces out there. Good to see you. I thought I saw a couple children wandering around. Did I? <laughs> there they are. Hi down there. You guys look pretty comfy down there. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, I will sit here. Can you listen to stay where you are and listen? I won't make you come up. It looks like you're having fun down there. So that's a pretty good place to draw. So that's good. Anyways, do you know that you are a gift? You ever thought of yourself as a gift? No? No one ever thought of yourself as a gift? You are. You are a gift to your mom and dad. 
You are a gift to your grandp grandpas and grandmas. Um, you are a gift to Jesus. You are a gift to the church. My bet is you're a gift to your teachers at school because you're there to help out and to learn at school. So you are a gift. Now, we're not gonna wrap you up in a box and put a bow on you, okay? So we won't do that. So it's not that kind of gift. It's more of a gift of your abilities, the things that you can do. And as you get older, you will learn how to do more and more really neat stuff that you can do. For example, someday you might learn how to plant vegetables. Yeah, you might. Someday you might learn how to help someone in a wheelchair. You might. Um, someday you might be the person who writes on the chalkboard at school, okay, uh, and gets to put down something. And someday you may know what 28 times 347 is. Okay? If you do, let me know, okay? Uh, I didn't do well in math. That's not one of my gifts. Well, we're going to hear a story today about someone, could be your age, who's in the story that we're going to read in a minute from the Bible, okay? So listen for that person. Find out who it is, okay? I won't get, tell you if it's, it might be a boy, it might be a girl. So you listen and see which it is. And find out what they bring, what the, what the person uh, is what gift are they sharing today, okay? So you listen, that's your job to listen for that, okay? And later on, tell, you, tell your parents, I know it was a boy or a girl, and I know what they brought, okay? Can you do that? So that's your goal this morning, okay? Have fun in school. Looks like both of you might be going to school, okay? So have fun in school. Um, this is a gift up here, okay? So use it, okay, to learn all you can learn, okay? That's important. All right, let's have a prayer. Most gracious Lord, we thank you for the many gifts that you bestow upon us every day. No matter our age, whether it be young or older, we can always share our gifts with others and know that you, God, share all the gifts with us uh, throughout the years through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So bless us today in worship and we bless the service today. In Jesus' name, amen.
That was nice. A couple housekeeping things before uh, we start this morning. Um, it's good again. It's good to see you all. I'm glad to be here. Um, it's interesting that uh, Pastor Lance is down in North Carolina um, doing a bluegrass thing, I think he told me. And um, I was just down in North Carolina uh, a month ago for a family reunion at the exact same spot. In fact, my brother, Mike, lives in Tryon, and I believe that's the church that he came from, that Lance came from. My mom and dad were members of that church. And I think I met Lance one time when we were down there to see my mom and dad. Um, he was associate pastor at the church at the time. Um, so I know the area very well, and it's very beautiful. We got lucky that we missed the, the heavy rain by about 100 miles. Just north of us in Kentucky is where they got clobbered. We had rain every day, uh, which was kind of a bummer, but not like they had. But I did have to drive through the mountains in that rain. And um, if you ever driven down there, even on the interstates, they are <laughs> like that. Uh, and um, I think we were going 30, uh, and that was probably too fast. Um, so anyways, um, so that's, I've been no right where, where he is down there and glad. Second of all is uh, my garden has gone bazonkos this year. And so there's lots of tomatoes out there. If you don't take them, I got to take them home. And my wife told me the other day we we're done putting tomatoes up. So uh, please, they're, they're really beautiful tomatoes. It's an interesting little lesson in my garden this year. I was working full time at St. John's this summer. And um, my garden kind of got not taken care of very well. And um, the weeds were about that high. And you know, despite that, I got a lot of vegetables which kind of says to me, maybe I don't have to work so hard. Um, yanking all those weeds. No, I mean, we had tomatoes out the gazoo and uh, beans and squash and cucumbers and onions and beets and all kinds of stuff. And I really did not, I can feel a little guilty. I really didn't work very hard. So God must have really been blessing me this year in the, in the garden area. Uh, so that was kind of cool that way. So please take some tomatoes. Um, some sad news in my family, which I'll share with you, is when we were down in North Carolina, my brother Jeff, the oldest of our family, was able to come up from Florida. He's been sick. And thank God he came, uh, because last week he died. Uh, and so we all were there. We all had a chance to visit with Jeff and have some time with him. Um, and uh, I'm heading down to Florida, actually, uh, this week for the funeral down in Orlando area. Um, weekend. And maybe you have thought about this before, but um, I'm convinced our time to die isn't in stone. And I say that because I think Jeff, he, he had leukemia for quite a while. And I think he just hung in there to go to that family reunion and just decided he was going to make it. And he came up and he actually looked pretty good. He was chatting with all of us, had a great time goes home, and two weeks later, he dies. I know of stories in my churches where a father said, I'm going to walk my daughter down the aisle, and um, comes out of the hospital, walks their daughter down the, down the aisle for their wedding, and then passes on three weeks or two weeks later. Um, and so it's interesting to me that, that that says something about our will, doesn't it? It says something about God's love for us to give us those extra moments that we need to finish up something that's important to us um, in our lives. And so we were blessed that uh, Jeff made it to North Carolina from Florida um, to sit with us and chat with us and eat with us um, for those couple days. Um, and that will be memories that we uh, will have uh, for a long time. So anyway, so um, to let you know about that. <clears throat> I did work full time this summer at St. John's. Pastor Todd, who some of you know, was on sabbatical. Um, I have had every title at minister title you can have at St. John's. I've used them all up. Um, right now, I'm a bridge pastor. Um, I've been a associate. I've been a senior. I've been a senior interim. I've been an associate interim. Um, 
that I pray that they get an associate pastor sometime soon, um, that they really need a steady person down there to, to kind of have that job. But um, I bring you greetings from the, the church down there. Uh, it's great to see your um, driveway out here. It looks wonderful. Um, many of you know that St. John's has put a roof on. Uh, if you want to talk about some big bucks, um, that's big bucks. The same company that did the courthouse did, did St. John's, and they did a really nice job. So, But we all have these older buildings, and stuff's got to take care of, you know, take care of our buildings. We've got we've to do it. So... <clears throat> they've been they've been busy down there at St. John's, so I bring you greetings from all the folks down there this morning. Our first scripture for this morning is from the book of uh, Ephesians. <clears throat> One last thing, I am fighting a cold, so if I sound a little like a foghorn, I am. I'll do my best to uh, speak slowly and carefully and loudly, but um, um, anyways. Here we go, Ephesians 3. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through the spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Our scripture lesson is taken from the book of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. And that goes like this. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people all sit down. Now, there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they all sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, so as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told the disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake. They got into a boat and started across the lake to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The lake became rough because of a strong wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the lake and coming near their boat. And they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the land towards which they were going. May God's blessing be in his holy word for understanding and our use in our daily life. I'm guessing that probably all of you could probably tell that story of the feeding the 5,000 from memory. Um, and um, you would know it pretty well from teaching in Sunday school and hearing it over the years being preached. Um, and it's one of those stories, one of the few ones, quite frankly, that you can find in all four Gospels. 
other than some of the stories at the end about the resurrection, which they all kind of have that together, um, John is kind of out there in left field compared to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, most of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are based actually on Mark. And each Matthew and Luke each add a couple stories, but basically it's Mark's outline they use. John is like in a different world. John has a completely kind of take on the world. And so very seldom do you get a story that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John all pretty much tell you the same, the same thing. And in John, the stories build from miracles, or as the author tells you, signs. That these are signs of Jesus' being God's son. And they, each one gets a little more important, a little more miraculous as you go through, through the story. It's interesting, too, that um, John is also interesting in connecting major events in Jesus' life with Jewish traditions and Jewish holidays. If you caught this today, they told you that, uh, John told you that this miracle happened just before Passover. About that? And we know that Jesus' last supper was probably, according to John, was, a, was Passover. Jesus died on Passover. So important events in the Gospel of John often are connected to Judaism. And maybe John is sending a message that Jesus is kind of the new leader of Judaism. But anyways, it's pretty easy when you know a story so well to overlook some of the little important stuff in there. Um, that shows up and kind of miss it. It's interesting that Mark and Matthew and Luke do not know about this little boy bringing up the bread and the fish. Not there. The bread and the fish just arrive out of the crowd, almost like a prop that you'd have in a play. Oh, there's the bread and there's the fish. But John has this little detail in there that a little boy gives the fish to the disciples. Now, that may not sound like a very important thing uh, by itself, but you wonder, why did John throw that in there? And one argument I would make often in the Gospels, when you get a Gospel giving you some really specific little details like that, it's probably based on an eyewitness account. Hey, where did those fish and that, uh, those bread come from? Hey, there was a little boy in the back that brought it up. That stays with the story as it gets passed on until it gets written down. So John's aware that there's a little guy in the, in the um, crowd that brings up the, the bread and the fish. And you know this because Gospels do tell you different things. If you read Luke and Matthew, the birth narratives, just read one of them, and you'll realize a whole bunch of stuff is missing. If you read Matthew, you're not going to hear much about Mary. If you read Luke, you're not going to hear much about Joseph. That the story that we put on here every time at Christmas time is a combination of those two books put together. But each one has its own little take on it, much like John having their own little take about this little story. Probably some eyewitness account that someone passed on to John that got written down. So anyways, the fish... Oh, they're knocked over. We find out that the fish comes from a kid, shows up. Now, that doesn't sound like a miracle until you think about it a little bit, but that kid had a lot of, lot of options that day. He could have gone fishing. He could have stayed home. And yet, he came with his mom and dad to, be, to see Jesus. And not every kid would do that. <laughs> um, not every kid would say, Mom, you go see Jesus. I'm going to stay home today. So he, first of all, makes a decision to come and be part of this big crowd on the hillside and to see what, who Jesus was. So we don't know what his motivation was. Maybe they made him come, but more likely he chose to come on his own. Secondly, um, he's got some fish and some bread. He could have just passed it on to his family. He could have said, hey, mom, here's some bread. Here's some fish. Let's eat that up. He didn't need to pass it on. They could have used that. They were there in the hillside. There was no food. There was no McDonald's. There was no Burger King. Uh, there was nothing there nearby. And so he could have just said, let's just eat this ourselves. That was an option. But instead, he volunteers it. 
the disciples. Now, anybody in the room would have said, well, five fish and or five breads, loaves of bread and two fish is very nice, but that's not going to feed 5,000 people. But it does. Yeah, it does. So this boy, I believe, is part one of this miracle. That what he did was to start, allow, prepare, prepare the props that Jesus needed for this miracle to happen. So imagine such a small and rather insignificant gift becomes the focal point for one of the really tremendous miracle stories performed by Jesus. And so I believe that this boy is a model for a faithful disciple. A kid. Acting like a faithful disciple. He is gathered with the body of Christ. He is freely offers what he has to the others. And in the grand scheme of things, you know, five fish and uh, five bread and f two fish is not a lot. It's small potatoes, I guess you'd say. But every gift in the world of Jesus gets multiplied over and over and over again. We see that all the time. That what looks like not enough becomes too much. In fact, they have baskets left over at the end of the story. It's kind of amazing if you think about that, that this Stuff went around and around, and everybody ate up, and everybody was hungry, and okay. Um, we got plenty. Um, quick funeral story. One time down at uh, the church in Broadhead, um, the ladies always guess, try to guess how many people are coming, you know, that game. And so they were expecting about 70 people. Well, for some reason, 150 decided to show up that day. And the gals come, they sit in back and count, you know, during the church service. And they come whipping back into the, in the kitchen and say, oh, my God, we're in deep trouble. There's like two, twice as many people as we got out there. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Literally, the moment they did that, a lady walked in. She had stopped the Kentucky Fried Chicken. She had brought in four of those tubs of chicken, a coleslaw, a mashed potato, gravies. And the lady just sat there and went, Amen. Now, I don't think that happened by accident, my friends. God said to that gal, you got to stop at Kentucky Fried Chicken today because they're going to be in trouble down there at church. And sure enough, they got through it okay. What we learn from this is every gift that we give to God gets multiplied whatever that gift might be, whether it's just some bread and some fish or if it's something more, more than that. Um, the power of God to make great big things out of what seems to be ordinary and small. And I think it took the, the disciples a while to figure that out. I really think that they struggled with that one uh, because we all know that this equals this. Not this equals that. And so uh, Jesus was teaching them all the time that God's love is so much more than we think it is. And that we believe it is. That we can even understand it is, right? And so we are amazed when something happens like that and we go, well, that can't happen. And it happens. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, proclaims this simple truth. He says... Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask for or imagine. That's a really good line. That's worth, that's worth a second shot. Now to him who by the power at the work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. That's in Ephesians 3.20. When we live in Christ and Christ dwells within us, then there is nothing that we can, cannot be overcome. It's much like what happens when a sports team is playing together and each person is adding their abilities to that. The team becomes more than a group of individuals playing a sport. I coached volleyball over the years, and I've had teams that had very good players that didn't play together. And we get beat. I've had teams with good players 
who played together, who worked together, saw themselves as a unit, saw themselves as a, as a group of team, as a volleyball team together. And those gals tended to win games just because of the way they perceived their gifts as being part of a greater whole rather than my gift is better than your gift and I'm more important on this team than you are. And I think that sometimes happens in the church. I think sometimes that kind of filters into the church a little bit that we don't think of ourselves as a whole, we think of ourselves as a bunch of individuals. Yet when we put it all together, that's when the really neat stuff begins to kind of happen and take place. And say, Paul sees this stuff happening in the church. When the members of the body of Christ share in the work of the church, freely giving their talents, their time, their resources, whatever they may have and be, then that's, my friends, when you see miracles take place in the church community. When every gift is deemed important, every talent is utilized, every gift is multiplied to the glory of God, and once you head down that track, stand back because stuff happens. And it's usually really neat and powerful stuff that takes place. I want to tell you one story to end here. <coughs> we had a girl, I was up in Sparta Church for eight years in Sparta and um, served in the church. And we had a, a neat little policy in that we let older teenager kids teach in our Sunday school. And one girl, um, Jill, she started off coming to church and singing in my choir as a little kid in the choir. She then, oh, she left, where did she? Then played flute um, and was a flute player and played in church quite a few times in church. And I think as a sophomore, she came to me one day and said, um, you know, could I teach Sunday school? I went, yeah, sure. What, what grade do you, do you like? She said, well, I want to try like fourth and fifth graders. And I said, yeah, we, you could do that. But I'll be honest with you, of all the teachers I've had teaching over 40 years of ministry, if Jill wasn't the best, she was in the top five. And she had her, she did a, one, one of her lessons was on the ecology and the environment. And she put a complete rainforest in her office, in her, in her classroom. She had all kinds of banners and posters and pictures and stuff. And the, the whole room was set up as a, as a rainforest. And they would, they would talk about how important the rainforest was and how God had created this incredible engine uh, down there in South America, which is one of the most important environmental things in the world that's being pretty much destroyed in terms of what it does for us all the time, the, the, what it creates. And um, she was wonderful. And Jill taught for three years till she graduated, went to college. And today, Jill is teaching in Iowa. Uh, elementary school teacher in, in Iowa. And um, uh, that's no surprise to me that that's the path that she took in her life. And what started as a simple little seed joining the youth choir that became a flute player in church, that became a teacher in church. Um, today, she, I think, is also a member of her church council at the church that she's at in Iowa as well. That doesn't surprise me. She's a leader. Those are the gifts that God gives us. And quite frankly, I'm sure some pastors or some um, people who run Sunday schools would say to Jill, well, thank you very much. Would you like to be an aide? And you can sit there and pill, pour the milk. You know, it's pretty easy for us to do that, you know, to kids. Some of the best sermons I've heard have been from my confirmation class kids. I'm not kidding. I'm not making that up. They have blown my socks off more than once. I think Zwingli does a pretty good job at this. And I would encourage you to keep on that, on that road of recognizing gifts and talents celebrating them among you, lifting them up, allowing people to share those gifts and talents freely in the life of the congregation. Back up and watch out for what God will do.
behavior. Let us uh, come before God in a time of silence as we offer God our own special prayers and concerns that we have. And I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer, and then we'll join together in our Lord's Prayer. Come before God now in prayer. You are the great I am, the God of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Leah and Rachel, Moses and Zipporah. From them have come a mighty people you have chosen to call your own. You have spoken through the prophets. Your priests have taught your people how to worship your name. With wisdom, scribes have delivered your word. With poetry, writers have expressed your holy word inspired by your grace. History has recorded testimony of your mercy that has withstood all the ages. What are we compared to your majesty and your grandeur? <coughs> Yet in love you sent us your son, Jesus Christ. He walked among your people and called them to be faithful disciples. Jesus enlightened his followers to the sense of your commandments. He stooped to hear the plight of the all caste and to offer healing to those suffering from illness and despair. He suffered the shame of the cross for the sins of all your people, and he now lifts us from condemnation to eternal life. The grace cannot contain your righteous deliverance. Jesus lives as our mediator and our God and our guide. We give you thanks for the major joys of our everyday lives, many that go unnoticed or we take for granted every day. Surround us now with hope as we seek to be faithful to your holy teachings. We ask your blessings on our congregation as we begin to look forward to a new program year here at Swingley. Guide our church leaders, our worship, our music leaders, and all those we call upon to carry the ministry and mission of the church into the community and into the world. Make us always mindful of our calling to be your faithful disciples. Let the legacy of our ancestors in faith empower us to create a holy and sacred place for our children and all the generations to come. We pray in the name of the one who connects us together as one loving family. Let us pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Earth as it is in heaven. Bless this day our daily bread. Our next hymn is a little new, so I think uh, why don't you play through the melody once so you can kind of hear it, but it's pretty easy to sing. I think you'll like it. It's called What Gift Can We Bring? <laughs>
one little guy in the crowd brought some food and shared it. And God made that incredible miracle of feeding a crowd with 12 baskets left over. What gift can you bring that God can multiply today? Go in peace. Amen.